Shalom, brothers and sisters. For this week's Thursday Thought, I'm more making an announcement, and that is to introduce a new book or volume of scripture that isn't really new called the Zohar, T-S-O-H-A-R. Now, I'm going to tell you up front, um, it, it really isn't anything new. So basically, when you would go to the Fellowship website, we have voted a number of books as canon. And, and I've talked before about the fact that we have an open canon here in the Fellowship, so people can accept or not accept or reject any of these books of Scripture. But when we are creating our own materials, these are the ones that, as, as a Fellowship, we have voted on and decided we're, we're going to use these. We can use anything. But these are the primary sources that we're going to use, and there's, there's a reason for each one, and, and I can discuss each one a little bit in this video, I guess. But the so Sohar is the Book of Remembrance, which we voted in as canon in 2019. The Book of Enoch, we voted in canon at the same time. The Book of Abraham, which is only canon for the Brighamites. I'm not sure. Someone can let me know in the comments. I don't know of any other... Latter-day Saint uh, branches that have that in their canon of scripture. So, but we wanted to include it in this work, even though it's a partial translation and or or divine writing. We're not really sure of its history. The Book of Melchizedek, which is also not canon, it's from the Place of Brass, and it's only I believe the first eight chapters that um, I have translated thus far. The Book of the Law of the Lord, which is only canon for the Fellowship and the Strangites, we, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we voted again in 2019 to include that as part of our canon in the Fellowship. The Visions and Parables of Zenos, which is from the Brass Plates, um, if you're unfamiliar with that, it's, it's basically, the way I like to describe it is, it's a similar, very, very similar vision to what John the Revelator had, but it's it's from a completely different perspective, and it seems to focus more on the divine feminine. So it goes through dispensations instead of opening of seals and, and so on and so forth. And it has a couple of parables in it um, and you know, some other things that make it a little more unique. In my mind, the purpose of this book is to, I guess, reintroduce or as part of the restoration of all things, bring back the divine feminine and also to help us understand the book of Revelation. Then the writings of Moroni and the Shlomna, which were translated by Hava Pratt, the uh, prophetess. I, I bore my testimony on her not long ago. Um, we voted those in as canon in 2020, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that sounds right. So um, basically, when you looked at the website, you know, we had the Bible, we had the Book of Avar, we had the Book of Mormon, we had Doctrine of the Saints, and then we, we just had all these books. Uh, Abraham wasn't on there, but it just got to be a lot. And so we decided to condense things. The Bible is, you know, the Old Testament, the Apocrypha, and the New Testament. Well, now we have the Everlasting Gospel, which is the Book of the Book of Avar and the Universal Book of Mormon, uh, which we put together in such a way that if you go to any church, I shouldn't say any, but most Latter-day Saints denominations, if they say, you know, look here in, in the Book of Mormon, you'll be able to quickly find it in this because of the way that it's put together. It has both the, the Brighamites, the OPV, and the Community of Christ, or RLDS, or RAV, uh, styles of chaptering and versing. So then Doctrine of the Saints, that's a collection of revelations from all over the movement from Joseph Smith till today. It includes the lectures on faith, the doctrines of the saints, all those revelations as you mentioned, epistles of the saints, uh, which some of the sections of the Brighamite Doctrine and Covenants actually came from letters, and so they, they really chopped that up and took what they wanted and put it in. What we did was, with, with epistles of the saints, we took various writings, uh, not just with Joseph Smith, but also Sidney Rigdon, myself, and others, and we, we put them together in such a way so that you have a, a, a more complete rendition of those sections in the, of the Brighamite Doctrine Covenants, and then you also have other information in there as well you know, for that, that hopefully will help us grow as Latter-day Saints. And we also have Hymns of the Saints, which is 
mostly the original hymnal from the uh, Church of Jesus Christ. And I actually I can't remember when it came out. It might have been the Church of Latter-day Saints at that time. Regardless, there's also some public domain um, hymns in there as well. There's no music, just the words. And then also I wrote one hymn in there about unity. Uh, and so those four books are all together in Doctrines of the Saints. The five books of Moses are on there. They're from the plates of brass. And they are the five books that Moses compiled and or are or, or attributed to him from the plates of brass. And then we now have the Zohar. Now I will tell you that there are two ways to spell, I want to talk about this a little bit. There's two ways to spell this word. One is T-Z-O-H-A-R, and the other one is T-S-O-H-A-R. The reason why I went with the S is because I felt really, really impressed by the Holy Spirit to use this word. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. But with a Z, it just looks like the Zohar. And we're already, you know, big on Mormon Kabbalah. And Jewish Kabbalah has the Zohar, which means you know, light, radiance. And so I felt like I wanted to honor what the Lord was asking me to do in, in naming this, or us to do, however you want to say that. But at the same time, I, I, I didn't want it to be so close to this other volume of work. And so I prayed on that, and, and it felt right. And so that's what I did. So what is what does this word mean? If you go to Strong's Concordance, you'll notice that it's used in Genesis 6.16, which is in the introduction, that, that scripture is in the introduction of the book. Uh, it says, you will make a window for the ark, is how it's translated in English. So it can it is used here, interpreted in English as window. Um, later on in Genesis 46, I'm sorry, 43, 16, it says, you know, you're going to dine with, with us or you will dine at noon. So it could also mean the time when the sun is at the very top of the sky. Um, so it can mean midday, it can mean noon. Some people say it means window, but in Judaism, there are rabbis that have this idea, and this is actually, if you look in the, the Brighamite church, the Salt Lake City Church's Bible, you look at the note there that they have in their footnotes under this particular scripture, Genesis 6.16, it, it, it makes reference to this idea that some rabbis believe that it wasn't really a window. Much like the Jaredites, it was a shining stone that allowed light into the ark. And so this idea, this, this mystical idea, combined with this idea that it can be translated to mean noon or even window, just really makes sense for this as a book of scripture because this is a shining stone. This is a window into the reality or perspective of God. This is the light coming down. When you're close enough to the equator, when the sun shines down, it eliminates all shadows. Now, wherever you are in the world, that isn't always true. And with scriptures, you don't always have a perfect understanding. But I love this idea that at noon, it's the brightest part of the day, eliminating as much darkness as possible. As a stone in the ark, you know, we're, we're as, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ, we are aboard the ark. Okay, we are in the boat that is saving us from the flood, and so to speak. And so we, there's this stone here to give us light so that we can see here as Christians what it is the Lord needs us to see. And that to me is what I feel when I read this particular collection of scriptures. That's what I feel that, that this Zohar is. So in a sense, this is very similar to the Pearl Great Price and the Brighamites, where they, they took some stuff. They're like, well, we could put this with Doctrine and Covenants and put this in the footnotes or in an appendix in the Old Testament or New Testament or what have you. Uh, but they decided not to do that. They decided to make their own little book called the Pearl Great Price. And the nice thing is that it can grow. As we gain more, we can take things and, and, and add them to them. At some point, when And I, I don't know if I'm going to be the one that finishes translating the, the plates of brass. I, I don't know how long I'm going to live. I don't know what the Lord wants me to do. 
the plates of brass are massive. They are huge. And I will translate whatever the Lord asks me to translate. And, and I'm already working on more translations right now. At some point in the future, myself or someone else that the Lord calls may pull a couple of these books out because they, they're from the plate of brass and put them into a into that book. Other books that are translated in the plate of brass may go there for now as, as a place for them to, to rest and to, to exist, to be temporarily. And, and that's the nice thing about being a Latter-day Saint movement is being able to have this open canon like this and being able to to be flexible. Yeah, we're not really going to mess with the Bible. At some point, if we if we have the time, if we grow to a point to where we're able to do it, so I would love for us to put together our own translation of the Bible. I would love to put in some more books that, you know, really could help us understand the gospel of Jesus Christ better, that we're left out for whatever reason or that we have now. But at the end of the day, the Bible that we have, you can buy a Bible at any bookstore. It's very convenient, very easy. And so there's no real reason to, to focus on that. The Book of Mormon, the only real reason why we did anything with that was because we as a Latter-day Saint movement, we're not very good at working together. So rather than having one Book of Mormon that we all use the same chapters and the same verses, we all have all of our you know, several different ones. And the reason why we picked these two to put together was because after looking into it, the five that, that I was able to find, these are the ones that the overwhelming majority of Latter-day Saints use. And when I say that, I mean churches, not not people. Um, there's a number of churches that use either the Brighamite or the Josephite versions of the Book of Mormon, even though they aren't Brighamites or they aren't Josephites. Doctrines of the Saints, that's a collection of, of writings that's its own special, unique book. So, of course, it's all going to sit as modern revelation together. And as we're putting the place of brass together, it makes sense. If it, here's the, the books of Moses, there, there's only five. We know that. It says so in the, in the well, I know that because I've seen the plates. But we also know that because it says so in the Book of Mormon. So we know we can say, okay, here's one section. Here's one group. And now we've got another book where we can put everything else. But they're not, I, I don't want them to feel like they are just this stuff that we're throwing to the side. Because these books are special. There's a lot of really amazing things in these books. And I want to talk about that just a little bit. And I apologize. This is going to be another long video, but hopefully not too long. The Book of, Remem the book of Remembrance is our Kabbalistic book as Latter-day Saints. It goes into many Kabbalistic points, not from a Jewish perspective, but from a Latter-day Saint perspective. And remember, there's a lot of people that believe very strongly and, and, and have shown evidence that Mormonism is very closely tied to Kabbalah, that Joseph Smith had access to Kabbalistic books and Kabbalistic teachings, and a lot of the things that he brought into Christian theology already exist, already existed in Kabbalah. He was just giving it to us in a understanding that Christians can digest. So we have the temple rituals that Joseph Smith introduced to us. We have Kabbalistic ideas that are in there from the past, but in way more depth and in stuff that, that wasn't ever brought in because Joseph Smith didn't live long enough. We have the Book of Enoch, which was scripture for the Christians that wrote the New Testament and is still scripture in, in Ethiopia for Ethiopian Christians and in other places. And this combines Ethiopian and I believe the um, Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, Ar Ar Aramaic, basically. These two, uh, and from a, a public domain source. Um, and I went through and, and looked at other translations, things together, and I also brought in Joseph Smith. So there's, there's seven sections of this Book of Enoch that includes Joseph Smith's translation that is in the Pearl Great Price. In the Book of Moses for the Brighamites, and it's in the Doctrine and Covenants for the Community of Christ, our LDS branch of our faith. So it, it's got traditional Christian along with Latter-day Saint Christian stuff all together. Then we have the Book of Abraham, which Joseph Smith, we, we don't have the papyrus that he translated. We have 
some sketches of things that, that he had, but that's really about it. There's evidence that says that he didn't really translate it, that this came from his mind, which means in my mind, because it's doctrinally sound, no matter what, it came from God. I believe that it came from God. Even if he didn't translate it literally from the Egyptian, there's no reason for me personally to say it's not scripture. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to accept it. If you think that Joseph Smith made it up, you are welcome to ignore it. There's five chapters there. Uh, but we went back to the, the purest source, the uh, Times and Seasons, which is public domain. We got the pictures. We got the, the scriptures. We put them together. And we did use the same chaptering and versing as our Brighamite cousins because they're the ones who are the most familiar with it. And so we wanted to make sure that when they saw this, even though some of the uh, spelling and, and um, uh, periods and such aren't exactly the same as theirs because they've, they've updated the grammar and the punctuation, um, you know, it, it's not going to be unfamiliar to them. It's not going to be anything new to them, but it, it's going to be new to a lot of other Latter-day Saints. Uh, Book of Melchizedek, there's 72 chapters. The Book of Remembrance is actually, um, according to one of the revelations of the Book of Remembrance, a lot of the Book of Remembrance was given to us so that we can understand the Book of Melchizedek when we get it. The Book of Remembrance says that there's 72 chapters in Melchizedek. I have only, ch I've, I've got the first almost nine completed with translating, but the Lord asked me to stop doing that and start working on the Books of Moses. And so only eight are out there for, for public consumption. Um, book of the Law of the Lord from James Strang, that's just the Book of the Law of the Lord. None of the notes are in there. So you're, you're getting just the, the words. Uh, eventually, we may put an appendix in that has his notes. I don't know yet. But there's more notes than there are Book of the Law of the Lord. It's a lot of notes. And we have not had a time to edit those yet. Vision, the parable of Zenos, I've already talked about a little bit. That is the full translation of that. Writings of Moroni and Shlomna, I've talked about that in another video. These are translations of another set of gold plates from Moroni. And from what I understand, Moroni told her to write down the translation. She didn't have an Urim or or anything like that. But, but the stuff in these books is deep. These are, when people talk about the mysteries of the gospel, this book has these mysteries. They have the things that when you read these, you're going to say, this is, this is not simple to understand. This is the meat. The Book of Mormon is the milk. The Zohar is the meat. So for those of you that have been Latter-day Saints or Protestants or Catholics for a long time, and you're like, you know, I've been studying the gospel of Jesus Christ I get the law of love. I understand I need to love my neighbor, my friends, my enemies. What more? I want to learn more. I want to build this relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to get more personal in it. This book is for you. There's a lot of really good information in here to help you understand better the scriptures that we already have. Now, I will say if you are new to the gospel, you probably don't want to jump into the Zohar. You probably want to jump into the New Testament, the Gospels, and the Book of Mormon. I always recommend people start with the Book of Luke and the Book of Mosiah. Those are a great starting point for those that are wanting to know what Christianity is and, and what the Christian message is. King Benjamin's address is phenomenal for understanding the Gospel of Jesus Christ. You can read all four Gospels. If you want to know what they mean, read King Benjamin's address. First, first few chapters there of the book of Messiah. When you're ready to dig into the meat, the Zohar is here waiting for you. So that's my Thursday thought for you, and I'll leave it with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.